All right. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 15 through chapter 5, verse 3. All right, here we go. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon, with our house, which is from heaven, if so that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Before we start I, uh, on this, I'd like to comment on what Hank said. You know, everywhere you turn around, there are such needs that it boggles the mind. I heard a tape the other day on a young man who considers himself to be an apostle to the unborn. He spends his time in Operation Rescue, getting himself arrested, adopting children, and doing everything that he can do to help save a few lives. And you listen to that, and man, that's why I put that Operation Rescue thing back on the, on the board. And it may not be for everybody, but it looks like God is raising up some to go out in, in confrontation in the street and try to do something about this wretched business of abortion. And I think in connection with that, that if Jews were being uh, happening to them here in San Diego County that happened in Germany during the Holocaust, I wonder what we, would we do? Would we go out? and get ourselves arrested to help the Jews or figure, well, we can't do all, we can't save the world. It's a difficult question, isn't it? It's no different between the Jews and these little fetuses. There's no difference. There's no difference. And then you've got the problem of the New Age. You've got the problem of child pornography and plus the preaching of the gospel. And then you've got the homeless and I mean, there's so many things, and you can't do everything. So I've come to the conclusion that the only way you can get the blood of the world off your hands is to find out what God wants you to do, present your body a living sacrifice, and make sure you are doing everything in your power. Now, we all can't spend all our time on these little unborn. But it's a good thing some are. And he told in his ministry how many children that he actually knew that he had saved from death. And it was in the 50s, 50-something, 50 53, that he alone, with his efforts, had talked the people out of an abortion or had done something. That's a tremendous ministry, isn't it? And then there's the whole thing of the young people on drugs. Just, just that area alone that David Wilkerson works with. And so I've come to the conclusion that the blood of the world is on our hands until we're, doing, we're finding out what God wants and doing it with all of our might. And we can't do everything. You can't do everything. I mean, you just spin in circles. So you have to find out where you fit, present your body a living sacrifice, and do it. And I think until we do that, the blood of these people, the little starving children, yeah, you look at them in different places in the Sahara and Ethiopia and so on. You know, how can you live and stuff yourself with food and, and with this going on? So the only way that you can have any peace at all, as I see it, is by finding what God wants you to do and then doing it with all your might. How does that sound to you? 
That's the only way. Otherwise, you'd never sleep at night thinking you couldn't eat breakfast. You think, you know, I'm eating here and there's children dying from lack of protein. And then you think of all these, this uh, murderous abortion going on and all the other stuff. You couldn't, re you couldn't find any rest. So I think what Nancy said is a part of it too, that we have to just say, okay, Lord, you know, I recognize my responsibility. Now you show me what you want me to do. And then I realize that it's going to be Jesus in me that's going to do it and just work that out day by day. So anyway, <coughs> I want you to be in prayer and keep in prayer about this broadcasting. We, we really want to get our message out, and it seems reasonable that we will, to the Russian-speaking people. So be praying that that thing will, will work out the way we get an hour a week broadcasting into Russia and into the Ukraine and into the Baltic area in Russian. And I think that's within the possibility if we keep on praying. And that's something that we can do, is to keep getting the word out. But everyone, if any feel led to do that Operation Rescue, get yourself prepared. You know, Melody Green got a concussion out of that. Uh, she went to, in, the, in the East Coast somewhere and some cop, I, I, I admire the police, I think the police are the greatest, but this Dumbo hit her on the head with a club and she still, she got a concussion from it. I can't imagine a thing like Melody Green, it was really necessary to hit her in the head with a club. I mean, this was really necessary. But anyway, what, what people will do in a melee like that, maybe there uh, was impossible to do otherwise, I don't know. No, but, Between the line of people in the place, and he, she wasn't doing anything but crawling. So good. That's why she got it in the head because he came. That's a price that she paid for trying to help bring a child into the world. So get set, people. I mean, this is the story of Christianity. This is the way it goes. It isn't always comfortable in church. But while God is stressing our minds on this thing of the resurrection, we'll give it our best shot, even though it's somewhat complicated and nobody ever heard it before and so on and so forth, but we're hearing it now. All right, now, in 2 Corinthians 4, we were, you, most of you are here this morning, if not, you get the tape. For all things are for your sake, that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. God is glorified when we give thanks. And that's the, what it's all about. And so as the grace goes out, people give thanks and praise because God looks down upon the earth and he doesn't see much thanksgiving. Can you imagine what God sees when he looks down on the earth tonight in America? Can you imagine the babble scream of people the fighting in their homes and all the jails, the stuff that's going on and screaming? And maybe one person out of a thousand, God, are here tonight, is offering praise to God. That's the only thing that keeps the whole thing going. Otherwise, all that God would be hearing would be the insane screams of demons. Right here, we're, we're right here now in, in Poway. If you could go into the homes, you'd hear arguing, <coughs> fighting. There'd be child molestation. Everything you could think of. People watching X-rated uh, TV the cassettes. Everything you can imagine, right all around us. And then in one little place, God looks down. There's people that are giving thanks and worshiping him. It's the only thing that keeps it going. That's a very important part of our ministry as Christians is just to give thanks to God, just to keep on praising the Lord. No matter how we hurt, it, the other people hurt worse. They hurt worse. You're not sleeping on a corner of a mission tonight, you know, with no... Uh, no more your stuff all gone because you're victimized by dr drink or something, lost your wife, lost your children, and everything else. I've been, I've, I've been down among people in Skid Row, and I, there's some pretty good people down there. But they get whipped with booze, and that's it. They just can't get loose. So, in verse 16, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Now, why did he say that? Why did Paul say that? Because it's easy to do. Huh? Because it's an easy thing to do. Sure, because he got tired like everybody else. And he figured, you know, it isn't worth it. 
I do something in a city, and as fast as I leave there, the big shots come through and tell them I'm all wet and they've got to keep the law, and I can't even get along with the other apostles. I don't know if you picture Paul driving around a fancy chariot or what you think, <laughs> but the Bible doesn't picture him like that. He was a tough little Jew, and he had physical afflictions, evidently an ophthalmic condition in his eyes. He was outcast by the Jews, and in many cases by the Christians. He spent a good deal of time in prison. I mean, he was not exactly a nice, posh minister, living a nice, secure life. I mean, this guy was a jailbird. So you could be sure that many, many times he was ready to lose heart. Our outer man is decaying. That is the body. Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Are you having that experience? You won't have it unless you are really serving the Lord. If you're not letting the Lord dig down there to where you're interacting with the Lord in death and resurrection, you won't know the renewal. It's those who overcome who get the hidden manna. <coughs> Him who overcomes. And you remember with, with Samson, after he got through slaying all these people with this skull or whatever he had from an animal, he was thirsty what happened? Do you remember? You don't remember what happened? Didn't I ever teach you that? I, said, I was preaching to some Jews and I asked them a question like that. They said, you're the rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. Don't, don't you know out of the story of Samson and the people he slew with the jawbone? You don't remember that? What happened when he was, after he was through? He was thirsty. Yeah, we got that far. And then what happened? <laughs> Do you remember? Huh? <laughs> God split the rock, but not on that occasion. <laughs> huh? Yeah, we probably water came from somewhere. But where did it come from? He drank it right out of the weapon that he was using. He drank it out of the jawbone. And that's the way it works. That when you're, uh, it's the Lord's warriors who get the hidden manna. Remember, David got access to the showbread, and that, uh, that is because he was fighting the Lord's battles. And you don't eat the showbread unless you're a Levite. David was from Judah. But he got that. It, it's to him who overcomes. And remember Jesus on the way up there to the well, everybody is hungry, and they said, there's no McDonald's here. There's not even a McDavid's here. There's nothing. And we're hungry. And what did Jesus say? He split the rock, right? <laughs> what happened? Huh? He said, I have meat that you don't know about. For my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And people that are not spending themselves that are not going out there to where they're famished and thirsty and at an end of themselves in the Lord, don't know what that's like. It's the people who, who are spent, spent in God, that the Lord gives them that hidden manna. Yeah. The inward man is renewed when the outward man is perishing. It's for the Lord's warriors, those who are doing his will. Evidently, the disciples weren't because he said, I have meat that you don't know anything about. <laughs> they weren't doing his will. Don't laugh. You may be next. All right. All right. And verse 17 is really critical. It's really critical. I don't know why when the apostle wrote, he didn't write things all in all caps when he came to something like this. <laughs> For momentary, notice that, because I know it seems like some of these things that God gives us last forever. I mean, you say, I've been at this thing for 20 years, I haven't got the victory over it yet. That is the way it is. It takes a long time to convert the soul from self-seeking to the God-centeredness. It takes a long time. It is not done 
in a short period of time. It takes a lot of... And in a higher rank that you're called to in the kingdom, the more this process is drawn out. And that's why Jesus said, if you want to be on my right hand and my left, it's not mine to give, but it shall be given to those for whom it has been prepared. And then he said, are you able to drink the cup and to be baptized with the fire? And whenever you're talking about rank in the kingdom, and that's always by predestination, it's always by God has the kingdom all laid out and there's no ambition enters into it. It's, it's a case of keeping that for which you've been called. And if God has called you to be a, a high officer in his troops or to have some place of government or in the priesthood and when the kingdom comes and each person is appointed to his own thing, if God has prepared for you a high-ranking place in his kingdom, if that is God's will, it's not your place to be cute and demure and say, I'm not ambitious or let somebody else do it or anything. You remember how God became angry at Moses because of that. It's not your place to go around in any false humility or anything of the kind. If God calls you to a high place in his kingdom, then that is what God has created you for. And all this other humility and stuff is just gets in the way. It has nothing to do with anything. It's just a lot of flesh. But God will have to shape you in obedience. And that's why Christ went through what he did, was because he had to learn obedience, because so much was entrusted to him. So don't complain. Don't complain. I think if we could see in the spirit realm, we'd see that every lash we get is, is just another diamond. It's, they're priceless, the chastenings of God upon our spirit. The fact that he leaves us on earth when so many are cut off in their prime to bear these onerous things that keep gnawing and chewing away at you uh, is merely an indication that... Uh, God is converting your soul because he has an eternal destiny. God doesn't waste anything. And he's not going to have you. Some people go through life com in a comparatively blithe manner. Every Christian isn't treated like Paul was treated. But look at the fruit that Paul bore. It came. Look at the fruit that came out of that Jew's suffering. It changed not only Western civilization, but Eastern civilization as well. When you go back uh, prior even to the Middle Ages, the work that was done, and it's some of it, I guess, is kind of lost. You can't tell whether it's mythology, what part is true, what part isn't. But evidently, the, uh, the apostolic word went everywhere, up into Siberia, every place you can imagine. In, in uh, Mongolia, the word reached out. It was in Scandinavia, uh, at least by the 700s, it was through Scandinavia, and when the explorers went out and went to Iceland and Greenland, the, the, the Vikings went out, they were going out as missionaries. You know, we're not taught these things in school. This, all these are the great explorers. They were going out as missionaries because Christianity was solidly established in Scandinavia from early times, and in Iceland from... Uh, the year about the year 1000 or 1100. Iceland's been a Christian nation. The United States is only 250 years old. Iceland's been a Christian nation for a thousand years. And Christianity is deep and strong there. Well, all of this was based largely on the writings of one poor Jew. So as God crushed him and crushed him and crushed him in the wine press, out of this was coming life for the whole world. And tonight, what are we reading? Paul. Now that's fruit. Now not everyone is called to the kind of calling that Paul was. But if you are, if you're going to bear fruit like Abraham, you have to be tested like Abraham. There's a lot of Jews that were never asked to give up their only begotten son. But neither were they the father of many nations. So out of 
the wine press comes the fruitfulness, and it's out of the death and the crushing. Life comes, except the corn of wheat fall on the ground and dies, it abides alone. So we don't ask for it. If you ask for it, you're a novice. If you ask for great fruitfulness, you know, beyond God, you're not in the spirit, but you suddenly get an enthusiastic impulse and decide you want to be another Paul. It won't be too long before God shows you what that's going to cost you. And it's very likely that you will decide, I better go back and rethink my motives. And you'll find out that it is not a case of, of the abominable expression to me is doing great things for God. Oh, if you had faith, you could do great things for God. That's an abomination. It said so. Has anybody ever heard anyone say that? Get out, we're going to do great things for God in this church. You don't find that in the scripture. That's not in the scripture. It says, with meekness and fear. And give an answer. You don't get out there and do great things for God. That's nothing but flesh. Because any great thing that is done for God is done out of somebody's crucifixion. Unless you particularly want to be crucified, don't try to do big things for God. It's much better to say, Lord, whatever you want for me, whether it's a great place or to sweep up behind the horses in the royal parade, whatever you want for me, that's what I want. And you receive buffetings in your life commensurate with that destiny. God is not going to grind you to a powder, convert your soul and everything uh, so that you can sweep up behind the horses. It's going to happen. But somebody has to do it. I don't know how horses work in the spirit realm, but that's, that's just a saying. <laughs> you know, everybody is not a chief. It's going to be Indians or else the chiefs don't make any sense. I know every Christian has been taught they're going to be a king and a priest, and they, and they do not have the foggiest who they're going to rule or for whom they're going to be a priest over each other. But they don't even think that far. They picture themselves in a nice, comfortable house, plenty of food, beautiful furniture, no dust, no dirt, no housework of any kind. You can eat all you want and not get fat. And then while they're sitting in there on their do-nothing, reading comic books, they're going to have a crown on their head. They're going to be ruling something. And somehow they're going to be a priest, whatever that means. Maybe take the crown off and then put on a bishop's mitre and then take that <laughs> off and then put a crown on. While they're sitting there reading comic books. They're not thinking past that. Nancy, is that right? Have you ever heard of anything think past that? Oh, I'm going to be a king and priest, and then I'm going to rule and reign, which is a redundant expression. So we, we don't use that here. Either you're going to rule or reign, but not both. <laughs> They're going to be a king and priest and rule and reign with God. Over what? Over whom? When? On what basis? Nobody has any idea, but it sounds real great. And if it was ever given to them, they'd die off. And they'd say, this is heaven, putting up with all these snot-nosed people. I don't know what we're talking about. It's a bunch of nonsense. Last time I used that expression, I got rebuked for it. But anyway, one must talk plain at times. And it's the Bible is not a mythological bunch of fables. It is practical. And we are not able to rule because we are brash and rash and we crash. I mean, we just shoo and break everybody's legs when we go run out in a fit of enthusiasm to quote, do God's will or quote, do big things for God, which is all a bunch of self-centered flesh. And so God puts up with us, gets what good he can out of it. And then he brings us down to reality in one way or another. God knocks us down. And we hit the ground hard. And we say, oh! And God says, okay. Now, if we're through with all this nonsense, 
Let's start with our ABCs. God says, you don't know me. You've heard about me. You know the language of the church and the choruses, but you have no acquaintance with me, and you're trying to tell other people about me, and you don't even know me yourself. And the way you know God, the way you come to know God is in the fire. It's as he keeps bringing you to a place where you cannot cope. And then he comes on the scene, and that's how you learn about God. Now, it's no fun to keep being rendered helpless. Sometimes God does it with sickness, in spite of the faith people. He, he perfects many a soul through sickness. Sometimes he does it by putting us in unpleasant circumstances. Sometimes he challenges us <coughs> different ways. He's got all kinds of ways, and they are all ingenious, tailor-made, calculated to reduce us to helplessness. And then we see we're not going to save the world. We're not even going to save the man next door. And we're having a hard time saving ourselves. And we come before God and we say, help. And that's the first honest prayer we've ever prayed. And from that point, God begins to build reality. When you meet people like that, you can tell that you're one with them. Instantly. You're not one with church people instantly. They're a scurvy lot sometimes. I'll tell you, you can't get the first page. You can't trust them. You can't trust them. But when you meet a real Christian, you know it. I don't care whether they're a Baptist or a Episcopalian or what they are. When you meet a real Christian, there's something in there. that this guy's got the stuff. He may say speaking in tongues of the devil and be all over the ballpark as far as doctrine, but you can feel in yourself that this person, you know what I'm saying? This person has really got the stuff. Well, that stuff has come from being brought down and, and coming to a knowledge of Jesus that is personal and not doctrinal. Well, that's the way saints are made. And if God, if you're going to be a pillar in the kingdom, not a pillow in a mansion, but a pillar in the kingdom. If you're going to be something on which, uh, like it says, him that overcomes, will I make a pillar? Now, pillars, pillars in Solomon's temple were extremely important. They had an aesthetic function. They had a, a prophetic function. And they had a structural function. And you could not touch one pillar without destroying the aesthetics, the symbolic meaning, and the strength of the structure. And that's the way it is with pillars in the temple of God. And God is making people who will be absolutely necessary for the temple of God. That's why it says they shall go out no more. In Revelation 3, verse 12, I believe it is. And, they, and you don't make pillars, you know, out of, out of just sand in the beach. A pillar has got to be made out of some material that has been made under pressure. And heat, rock, rock, because it's got to stand, you know. I don't, what is still standing in Greece is still part of the Parthenon, isn't there? It's still standing in the Acropolis. And some of the, what are they, marble? Marble. And then they have lead uh, in the center. And lead in the center. And some of those things are still standing after 2,000 years. And they're still standing over there. And that only the God's pillars are going to stand forever. And brother, they're not made out of balsa wood. They are made out of rock, marble, granite, with lead, metal in them. And, and if you are called to be a pillar in the temple of God, and, and you know, you only have so many pillars in a temple. You only have so many pillars. You've got to have other things besides pillars in a temple. You've got to have a roof. You've got to have walls. You've got to have a floor. You've got to have... Windows, you know, everybody can't be a pillar. And the type in the Old Testament is in David's mighty men. In the first place, the mighty men were select out from the Israeli army. There was an army, and then there were the mighty men. 
And then out from the mighty men were selected 30, and out from the 30 were three. And there was a captain of the three. Now, God doesn't put things in the Bible for nothing. And you can see this in Jesus. He spoke to the multitudes. Then he sent out the 70. Then he called 12 to himself. But when he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, he took how many? Three. And then he gave to just one man the understanding of the transition from Moses to Christ. Just one man. Because Peter didn't have it straight. James was all occupied with the practical. John was occupied with the visionary. But Paul is the one who wrote stuff that people couldn't understand. The apostles couldn't understand it. One man God picked to make the transition from Moses to Christ. And we're still having trouble with it today. In fact, we're talking, I know you don't see the connection between this resurrection, but we intend to get there to show you why it explains why we're not under the law. Oh, we're getting there, so be patient. But we didn't ask to be mighty men, and I'm sure the mighty men were the way they were because God had endowed them physically in a way that he had not endowed everybody else with courage, with speed, with height, with, with strength, with stamina. They were endowed men, and they just naturally came to this position. Some of them of these men were phenomenal. I mean, they'd kill hundreds of men by themselves, single-handedly. And three of them one time broke through the whole Philistine army just to get David a drink of water. Three men. These were outstanding people. Well, I don't know what the attitude of the rest of Israel was to these men. If Israel was like most people are, they spend precious little time admiring their heroes and much more tending to their own business. So trying to be a hero in the front of people is a vain and useless preoccupation because people are not spending much time worried about how great you are. So God has a kingdom that is organized, and it comprises, especially from a military standpoint, all kind of ranks. And in order to be at a certain rank, you have to be endowed. It's not a democracy at all. It's not a democracy whatsoever. There's nothing fair about it. There is nothing fair about the fact that Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was, was so powerful even when Solomon became king. Now, Joab was one of the mighty men. Joab was leader of all of the forces because he took, uh, he took uh, Jerusalem from the Jebusites. And so he became commander of the host for a reward. But David didn't like him because he killed Abner. So... And he killed Abner because, you know, there can only be one dragon in a country you know about that. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's why uh, Joab killed Abner, because there can only be one commander of the host. <laughs> so he got rid of Abner, but David never forgot that. So when uh, David passed the thing on to uh, uh, Solomon, he said, don't forget, don't let Joab go down to his grave in peace. David couldn't do anything because Joab was too highly placed. And David was a smart enough politician to know what he could do and what he couldn't do. But he said to his son, so the first thing Solomon becomes ruler, he says to a priest, Benaiah, who was one of the great heroes of the Bible to me, is Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. And if you don't know about Benaiah, I invite you to study about Benaiah because he's been a hero of mine for most of my Christian experience. He was the fellow that went down and slew a lion in a pit on a Noah on a snowy day and met an Egyptian and, he had, and Benaiah had a staff and he beat the Egyptian spear out of his hands and killed him with his own spear. Don't you love that? So anyway, I mean, this guy was a priest, you know, which brings me to another sidetrack. <laughs> I'm looking for the day when at the Feast of Tabernacles that they have warrior priests coming down the aisle. I mean, there's a place for the young men and their candles and the ladies and whatever it is the ladies have. And after all that's out of the way, what I would like to see is God's priests in their sandals and hairy legs coming down that aisle with their spears and trumpets and drums. Oh, I hope that comes to pass. Well, anyway, so Solomon uh, said to Benaiah, 
Joab is history. And, and Joab, Joab didn't want to fight. He, he went in and took hold of the horns of the altar. And Benaiah, the priest, went right after him and killed him. He, I mean, Joab, and it didn't mean anything to Benaiah. He was a mighty man. Now, it, the fact that Joab would not fight him tells me this priest must have been huge. And he must have been very expert in war. Well, now, God has people like that. And they're endowed. And everybody isn't like that. And it's not a case of a democracy. So if God has made you a beautiful little flower in his kingdom, and all he wants to look, do is look at you and, and think how beautiful you are, then that's your place. You know, there is a place on earth for flowers. Wouldn't this be some world if there were no flowers? And they don't work. They don't know anything. They don't worry. They just reveal their beauty. I think there's people like that. God has children and puppy dogs. But he also has priests with spears and sandals and hairy legs. <laughs> and so during Christianity, what God is doing is he's bringing, he, he's perfecting his kingdom. Everything is projected toward the resurrection. I mean, the life that we're in now is a real life. It's a real life. But it has meaning only in terms of the future. That has no meaning in and of itself. All the things you're doing is not to accomplish something here, although there may be an important byproduct, but the most important thing is you. Because you're going to be serving God forever. Forever. And ever. And ever. And if God wants you to be a powerful priest or a teacher or uh, 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 someone that works with children or with old people or whatever thing God has for you in his kingdom, that's what this life is doing. It's preparing you. And so if you're called to be some high political office in the kingdom, like Daniel was the third ruler in Babylon, I think, something like that. If you're, if you're called to that kind of a thing, God is going to spend all your life just, just looking for all the nuances of your personality and making sure and testing and testing and testing and testing and testing so that you won't blow it. Yeah. And if you're not called to that high an office, your life will not be like that because you don't, you don't want everybody like that. You don't want it. What if every Israelite was like Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada? Man, that'd be a rough place to live. <laughs> no, you want, you've got to have all of the violinists, you know, and students, people that do all kinds of things. And God loves us. So, so that, our time is peculiar right now, 1989, because God said, many that are last shall be first. And he means last in time and first in the kingdom. So ours is peculiarly an age of bringing forth mighty men. It's peculiarly that. And uh, as Nancy pointed out, uh, it is not, and it's absolutely true. The first, if we're ever going to be a mighty man, the first thing that we learn and the most important thing that we learn is we have no strength in ourselves. So God's mighty men in the kingdom are those who are mighty in the Lord. They have learned to depend on God entirely. And that is an endowment. That is something that God puts in them. What, what is in them is, oh God, thy will be done. And when other, ever, other Christians are waffling around and wobbling around and fluctuating around, every once in a while as God will raise up someone and say, thy will be done, thy will be done, thy will be done. God's will be done. That's an endowment. That's a gift. That, that, that isn't something we drum up. It comes. And if it does, and if we do the things that God says, it has moment for the kingdom. And it brings many people along with it. It's not necessary that everyone be like that. Everyone has to be that way to a certain extent. But God has leaders. There's going to be leaders in the kingdom. And we don't aspire to that. Don't aspire to that. We do not aspire to that. Can you hear me? We do not aspire to that, okay? Because if we do, our motives are wrong. Automatically. Because leadership in the kingdom comes from an intimate knowledge and interaction with God and a broken heart concerning people. And God's true leaders have little desire to be preeminent. When man leads, he wants to be preeminent. He leads because he wants people to see him. 
God's leaders lead because they are in an interaction with God. It's altogether different. Altogether different. But we suffer for these reasons. This is why we suffer. It's because left alone, we're no good to God and we're no good to people because we are fat and sassy and self-centered and foolish. How many in here, if you have one good day, start getting foolish? <laughs> one good day and you're going to crack everybody up. Huh? You're the life of the party. Just one good day. And you got to get beat about the Jane, what are you looking at me like that for? It'll all come in time. Just hang loose. Maybe you don't get foolish, but I do. <coughs> you give me five minutes of peace, and I begin to bark at the dogs. <laughs> yeah. June will tell you. She has to put up with it. <laughs> For momentary light affliction, and it is light, people. It is light. You say, oh, it's so heavy. It's driving me down, so I'm walking on my ankles. If you get your mind off your cross, it won't be nearly as heavy. If you fasten on your cross, you won't be able to bear it. So you got a cross, so big deal. It's working something in you. Get your mind on something else. Don't dwell on it. Don't dwell on everything that's wrong in your life. Find something that is good and concentrate on it. You go under if you... Uh, say, oh, this, I'm bearing this. I can't stand this for one more minute. You may have 30 more years coming up, and I can't stand this for <laughs> one more minute. You'll be surprised what you can stand for one more minute. But you just say, all right, soul, uh, let's get our mind on something else. <coughs> and then you'll find out you can make it. There's times it'll crush you down. And you're the spare of life, but these are seldom that things like that happen. Most of it is just a steady thing. And if you don't expect this earth to be heaven, but just accept it for what it is, a cursed planet that God is saving you from, and say, okay, I'm going to count my blessings. I'm not going to spend my time on what's wrong, but I'm going to just appreciate what's right. You'll make it fine. It's a light affliction. It's, um, people of the world have heavy afflictions. Heavy afflictions. And there's no relief in God or anything else. They're really, the way of the transgressor is hard. But us Christians have a momentary light affliction. Momentary, yes. Seventy years in God's eyes is as nothing. And you know that there will come a day when the cross is lifted from your back. Yeah. And not necessarily when you die. It doesn't say anything about when you die. When the work is done. When the work is done. The cross, you know, Jesus isn't carrying his cross today. There'll come a time when the cross is lifted from your back. And you probably won't be able to take it emotionally. It'll ball like a steer. Because, we, because that has held us in check for so long. And to be released into unblemished glory... To be released into a state before God when there are no problems. You have absolute authority as a son of God and you're in the place where God wants you and the cross is a thing of the past. You go to pieces emotionally at the wonder and the glory of it all. Jesus isn't carrying his cross today. Paul isn't in his prison today. Job, and see, Job came out while he was still living. So did Abraham. And not in the Bible says you've got to carry a cross when you die. But it must be carried until the conversion that is appropriate to your destiny is accomplished. And if it's a high destiny, it may go through your life. But then, when you're released from your flesh, and, and you know, you, you come up before God and this weight of glory has been created in you, and you come in to bow, go up the white steps to the Father and fall down behind him and take the mark that is in your hand that you were given, the, the baton. See, there you can gain that mark. 
I press toward the mark. You can gain that. And you, you bow down before the Father in his holy presence. And you give back to him that which he gave to you to possess. Oh, glory. And you come out having been in the presence of the Father and then arrayed in the robes of God with your scepter and the marks of your authority and your station in the kingdom, knowing that in the day of resurrection you'll be with Jesus as a high ruler in the kingdom. It'll be worth it. If that is your calling. Other people don't want that. They don't even want to be seen. It's like there'll be a little mouse scurrying around somewhere. Huh? It isn't the same for everybody. We don't all have the same calling. But God will have a wonderful place for you if you do his will. And you'll say, oh, thank you, Father. This is so perfect for me. This is just exactly what I wanted. You won't envy the apostles moving like the planets in their orbit. You'll be just glad to be you. And you have all eternity, and every chapter is better than the chapter that went before. Forever. But right now, we have a momentary light affliction, and the purpose of it is to change us inside. Because we are animal, because we are soulish, because we are self-centered. And the only way that God can do that is the way he does it. Now, it says momentary light affliction, and it is affliction. Make no mistake, it's no picnic. It's no picnic. Those that have been through with the Lord's dealings know that it's no picnic. Boy, he can rip the heart out of you. Is producing. Is producing. It's not something that you get by grace. It's not something that you get by mercy. It's not, so, it's not a gift that is given you. It's a product. What you want is not things, believe it or not, it is a change in you. Things are as nothing. Heaven. We talk about jasper walls, mansions. They are as nothing. The incredibly valuable treasure is the change in you. And only God can do that. It would be just like a child. He hopes when he's a young child, a girl, a little girl is hoping that she'll grow up maybe to be beautiful or graceful or a dancer or attractive or personable or have many, many friends or whatever, be a great actress or something. And a little boy may want to grow up to be whatever he wants to be, a soldier or what. But you're hoping that you will grow into this because you're occupied not so much with things as with what you are becoming. You, can you remember when you were 12 years old? Huh? Everything was geared toward what you were become. Well, I hope someday I can play football like that. I hope, you know, that I'll be big and strong or beautiful or whatever. It's a change. And then as we get older, we just don't care about things like that anymore. We, be, we become interested in things and relationships. But in, in right, what is important now in the kingdom is not what we get. We don't want gold or diamonds. What good would that be? They're no good in the economy of heaven. You can't. You can't uh, save up stuff like that and buy a house. What, whatever you want is given to you. Whatever you have need of is given to you. So th these things don't matter to us. The, the important thing is the change in us that will make other things possible, particularly a relationship to God. A relationship to God. And where we are in his favor and with him. Change in us is of value today, not what we get. All we need is enough food to stuff in our face, a bed to lay down at night, and a roof when it rains. That's about all you need in California. You may have a closet full of suits, but you can only wear one at a time. Huh? You may have a freezer full of food, but it doesn't matter. All you can, like, like the bum down in the mission, you can only eat one meal at a time. The reason we lay up so much is because we don't trust God. Money in the bank is a substitute for trusting God. But it doesn't matter because these things are added automatically. What is of inestimable value is what is happening to us. Are we changing? 
Are we learning our lessons? Are we coming to know God? Are we becoming made? How do you compare now with a year ago? How do you compare tonight? Have you grown? How can you tell? Do you have more patience? Have you been released from bondages? Do you have more insight into God? That's what this life is about. It's learning about God and growing up in his presence and becoming what he wants you to be. And that is a product. It's not handed to you. It's a product. And he says this, our momentary light affliction is producing. It's your affliction that you don't like is producing what you want. And if you can see that, it makes it a lot more bearable than to think Satan's getting a shot in at you or you're just going through a lot of unnecessary hard things. If you can see that, and you keep praying, you don't take things uh, recklessly. You keep in prayer, say, Lord, if this isn't of you, remove it from me. But so, many times he doesn't remove it from you. That thing is producing, 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 producing something in you. And that, brother, sister, you can take with you when you die. You can't take a nickel with you when you die. You can't take, I know they buried Thomas Larson with his trumpet. Well, that was in San Diego. He's a Christian who played the trumpet. He used to play the holy city on the trumpet and other things like that. Well, they buried him with his trumpet. Well, that's a nice gesture. But guess what, people? He is still there in the grave. He did not take it with him. You know, you might die and I'd say, honey, leave 50 bucks in my billfold just in case. <laughs> it isn't going to go with you. I mean, you came into the world naked and that's the way you're going out. No matter how hard you work. And you're going to leave it to your kids and ruin their character because they don't have to work. But this thing that is produced in you from affliction, you take every tiny bit of it with you. It's a solid inheritance. You can't leave it with anybody. It goes with you. Praise the Lord. So if you're smart, you'll spend not so much time laying up money, which you can't take with you, but laying up character, which you can take with you, because it's going to serve you for eternity. There's no place, there's no place that I know of, maybe you do, but there's no place that I know of after you die physically where you can learn the things that you learn on earth. The angels are not like us. The angels have not been brought down. Did you ever hear of an angel learning patience? Did you ever hear of an angel learning meekness? Or to trust God? Or to have Christ in him? Or any of these wonderful things? It's not possible. The angels are not subjected to suffering. They're not subjected to perplexity. They're not subjected to persecution. None of these things. Neither is there the image of God in them. They are simplistic creations. We are complex. We are a very complex creation. And we have there in that potential to be in the very image of the Father. In the very image of the Father. In the very image of Jesus who is in the image of the Father. We have that potential. But that potential is only realized through these afflictions. It's the afflictions that produce. It takes the potential that is there and shapes it, just like hammering the lampstand into shape. You get the gold of divinity, which is Christ in you, but it comes in like an ingot of gold, like the ha uh, lampstand was hammered out of one talent of gold. When they started, it was just a block of gold, just a brick of gold. When they got through, it was the menorah, the Hebrews, the, the seven, lamp, the seven uh, things there. The uh, lampstand with the six side lights. That's the way we are. You can't hammer wood. Now, a lot of carpenters do. But it doesn't produce anything but bear tracks. Okay? <laughs> you don't hammer on wood. Wood you can sand and you can shape and paint and nail, but you can't hammer it ordinarily and get much out of it. Well, you do, do you know, if the dimensions aren't exactly what they're supposed to be. You make it fit, but uh, that's not real cool in the trade. That's not the best way. <laughs> But gold, you can't plane and sand and do all this stuff. Gold is hammer in the shape. 
And you can afflict this natural man all you want to, but all you do is you leave bear tracks. That's why the afflictions of the worldly do not work the image of God. They work bitterness, rage, revenge, destruction, drunkenness, and other things. But you see, the Christian has got gold in him, the gold of divinity. And it's that that is hammered into shape and keeps its shape. Your faith being more precious than gold. So, so that's <coughs> producing an eternal, eternal, you see it, how many see it? It's not written up here on my face. It's 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Some of you look absolutely flabbergasted. In 2 Corinthians 4, 17, it says, it's producing for us an eternal, an eternal. Now, what is producing for you an eternal? Your afflictions. If you take them right and don't yowl and howl till God takes you out of them. But if you stay with the Lord and, and pray and interact with the death and resurrection, it's producing something eternal. And it is not vaporous. It is not vague. It's a weight. There's a weight being produced here. An actual, substantial weight. And it's a weight of glory. Now, glory is a hard term to cope with. I don't know what it conjures up in your mind. Fire, light, gold. Or what the word glory, it's, it's nebulous. It's not like a weight that we can picture. We can picture a weight or something. But glory, we use sometimes to mean status, popularity, whatever you want to call it. But in God's presence, glory has to do with association with God. That wonderful presence and light coming out from God of of eternal life, incorruptible life and knowledge. Remember Jesus said, and this is life eternal that they might know thee. Now, see, how can knowledge be life? This is life eternal that they might know thee, making knowledge the same as life. And then again in John 1, it says, in him was life and life was the light of men. We don't think of light being the same as life. And we don't think of light as being the same as knowledge, our life being the same as knowledge. Uh, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, but they're all one. And they have to do with the presence of God. And the presence of God is a state of exaltation, of bliss, of life, which is light, it's understanding, and it's life. And by life, we move by life we grow, by life we communicate, by life we move. These are the things that life enables us to do. And all these things come from the glory and the presence of God. And the more weight of this glory that you have, the more light that you have and are, that is, the more people can see God in you, and the more knowledge that you have of his presence, being, not knowledge in the sense we know about him, but knowledge in the sense that we interact with his heart. It has to do with closeness to God, the presence of God. And then it has to do with the strength of life, of moving, of growing, of working, of serving. And so this is a weight of glory. Now, these weights will vary from person to person. There will be some who are like the Lord Jesus Christ himself in his image, junior editions, but nevertheless, even a junior edition is, is more marvelous than anything we can picture. And that's the way you'll be forever, radiating God and being in his very presence. There'll be other people on the other extreme, as I told you, who were saved, but have had their talent 
what God has given them in the form of a personality and abilities which are really run together because if a person took away all your abilities, you would not have the same personality. Isn't that true? Huh? Uh, can you picture that? Bill, if, if from you were, was taking your engineering ability, your ability for mathematics and to think in terms of pre precision, and this was taken away, you wouldn't be the same Bill. And that's the way we are. And these are talents that God has given us and equipped us with. And if you don't serve the Lord with it, you could still be saved as by fire, but that fire will cause that talent to leave you and to be given to another. And so that person will be an effusion representation of God's person and glory. Wherever they go, they'll be almost, unless they, unless they conceal their glory, you won't even be able to look at them. Can you hear me? See, that's the way Jesus is. Jesus can't come to you in the fullness of his glory. You couldn't anymore than you could look at the sun. And there'll be people like that too, that are just the very presence of God, his sons, radiating his presence, all the way down to people who are just spirits, receive no weight of glory, lost their personality, have spent time in the outer darkness, and God has saved them, but they must be ministered to and nurtured all the time, like Lot. They have lost everything. <clears throat> Abraham, everything, Lot, nothing. All his cattle gone, his wife gone, everything gone. Now that's the way the kingdom is. And there are greater and less in the kingdom. He that teaches these shall be called great in the kingdom. He that does not teach these shall be the least in the kingdom. How many remember when Jesus said that? You don't remember when Jesus said that. You do remember when Jesus said that. You don't remember when Jesus said that. Well, he said it in Matthew, in the Beatitudes. No, not in the Beatitudes. In, uh -huh. He said, what did he say? He said, whosoever shall do and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom. But those who do not do and teach them are called least. He didn't say they're lost. He didn't say they go to hell. He didn't say they go to the lake of fire. They're least in the kingdom. And so God is setting up, and, and we want to be what God wants us to be. But in order to be that, you have to submit yourself to God's program for you that is tailored as an, as an individual. So don't gripe, don't complain. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. You're still here, aren't you? Huh? After being hollered at for 13 years, you're still here. Huh? You're still going along. You thought you'd die a long time ago. You're still here. And hopefully you've grown some in that time. And no more of the Lord. So, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's stand and we'll... Thank God that we are still here. And, if, and I think it would be a good idea for us to, given the Operation Rescue, given the uh, different activities that are needed in the world and... Maurice has a burden for the homeless, and Hank has mentioned to us the homeless and the down and outers, and Hank put it so well, they just can't seem to get started. And a lot of it is laziness. But on the other hand, who gives us ambition? We who are ambitious hate the lazy. Oh, I hate laziness with a passion. But I have to remember that God hasn't endowed, endowed everyone with the same amount of, of ambition. Some people are just kind of sick along that line. They just can't work. I've seen it. What do you do? Curse them? No. God says the poor you have with you always, you have to be helpful. So we just have to say, okay, Lord, I can't save the whole world, but I can do something. And then present our bodies a living sacrifice. Father, we come unto you tonight, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you that you are leading us from grace to grace. And from glory to glory, and that we're being changed. Hallelujah. We are being changed. And we praise you, Lord. And we can see the growth over the last 10 years or 20 years, Lord. We can see the totally different person that we are. Lord, as you have ministered change to us, Lord. And has caused suffering, and has caused perplexity, and it has caused 
us to many, many times just experience patience and wait and pray and hope and trust. And we praise you for every day. We praise you for every trial. We praise you for every affliction, Lord. We give thanks to you. Hallelujah. Yes, we do, Lord. And, we, and you've always delivered us from time past. Always. And we know that you are going to deliver us from the things that are threatening us now. We know it, Lord. We know it. You have brought us through. And we praise you, Lord, that you are going to straighten it all out. It is going to happen. And we'll look back on it when we're worrying about something in the future and say, well, God took care of that. We know you will, Lord. You always have. We praise your name for it. We praise you in advance, Lord. And say thank you for delivering us from our problems. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Lord, for these goads, these wasps that drive us to God. Keep us praying. Keep us seeking. Keep us interacting. Hallelujah with you, Lord. And death and resurrection, we praise you for it, Lord. And in the midst of all of this, Lord, help each one of us to find some ministry, Lord. Something that we can do to help, Lord, a world that has come to us wounded, bleeding, drunken, ignorant, blind, not knowing what is going on, Lord. Help us, Lord, to find something that we can do, Lord, that will minister to the needs of people. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Something practical, something we can put our hands to. Grant it for each one of us, Lord, that we'll find a place to use our talents. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name. We give you thanks, Lord. We give you thanks, Lord. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name. Lord, and do your people with gifts, I pray, Lord. With ministries. Opportunities for ministry. Hallelujah, Lord. Pour out your spirit upon this church, Lord. Amen, Lord. And then do us, Lord. With the Holy Spirit in a greater way, Lord. So that we can gain new vistas of ministry, Lord. New opportunities to serve. Hallelujah. Enlarge our borders, Lord, that we can be of help, Lord, in this world. Jesus, we praise you, Lord. Jesus, so many people need you, Lord. This whole new age thing, Lord. Maybe someone in this room would be an apostle to the new agers, Lord, and convert many of them, Lord, for they are heading toward torment that is unbelievable in the spirit realm when they find out that they've been deceived. Jesus, Lord, remember these people, Lord, in their arrogance and ignorance. Jesus, hallelujah, praise you, praise.